Good morning, everyone. Really great to be with you here at the 11.30. I'm normally down at the 10.30 at Onslow Square, so it's a real treat to be up with you all this morning. And as Catherine, amazing hearing those stories of those lives transformed when people meet with Jesus, I'd like to talk on the topic of how an encounter with Jesus can transform our lives. We're going to read a passage from the Bible from Matthew chapter 8. It's verses 1 to 3. It's going to come up on the screen, and I'll read it along here. It says this, when Jesus came down from the mountainside, large crowds followed him. A man with leprosy came and knelt before him and said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. Immediately, he was cleansed of his leprosy. I'll pray for us and then we'll look at this passage together. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much that when we meet with you, we're filled with joy and peace. And it's possible to know a relationship with you and to experience your love. And I pray for each one of us this morning that we would know that love. In Jesus' name, amen. Liz, my wife and I have got two children, um, Annie who's nine and Florrie who's just about to turn seven. And one thing that we've done since they were very young is instituted a very strict bedtime routine. So at 6.30, they go into the bath. At 7 p.m., it is into their, uh, well, they go into Annie's bedroom. They're allowed to play from 7 until 7.50. At 7.50, an alarm goes off in their room, and it is tidy time from 7.50 till 8 p.m. At 8 p.m., they are, <laughs> I'm just laughing, because the system doesn't work. <laughs> They're meant to then like do quiet reading from 8 to 8.30. 8.30, it's lights out. Our oldest daughter, Annie, will abide by the system. I just spotted somebody who's babysat for our kids over there thinking that system's a joke. Um, (laughs) Because our eldest daughter will abide by the rules, but our youngest daughter, Flory, does not abide by any rules, whether it's bedtime, at school, or any other time of the day. And this plays out in that approximately 15 times in an evening between seven and eight, she'll come downstairs for various reasons, ranging from things like, I think there's a fly in my room, or I can't remember the name of the horse that I rode last year, or my nose is itchy, my finger hurts, there was a fly in my room last week and I'm remembering it. (laughs) Endless reasons, can I have an apple, can I have a biscuit, and As she comes down each time, I get sort of more and more irritable with her. And I was like, Flory, will you please go back upstairs? Like, get upstairs. And last week, Liz was out and I was downstairs watching something on TV. And I think, like, I don't know if it's a bit selfish, but like, that is like my time. It's like seven o'clock in the evening. That's me. Netflix is on. I'm just like, I've got to have my own space. And she came through the door and immediately, I think she'd already been down three or four times. And I turned to her, I can hear her on the stairs. And I was like, what do you want, Flory? What do you need? And she walked into the room and quite unlike her, her lips started trembling and then her chin got a bit wobbly. And she's like, Dad? And I was like, oh, something's wrong. And then she burst into hysterical floods of tears and she's like, Dad, I've got leprosy. (laughs) And I I said, oh, okay. And I sort of picked her up and put her on my lap. And I was like, oh, Floss, I think it's really unlikely that you've got leprosy. And she said, no, my fingers are going to fall off. My nose is going to fall off. I've got leprosy. Really, really panicking. And I said, I'm sure you don't have leprosy. I'm not even really sure you can get leprosy anymore, Floss. And she said, Annie told me I had leprosy. So I called Annie downstairs. I was like, Annie, what, like, what's happened? Like, why does she think she's got leprosy? And Annie then went on to explain that Annie, sweet Annie, who's always following the rules, was reading a story from the Bible where Jesus meets someone with leprosy and then Flory was asking what it was and then she asked Alexa to explain about leprosy and then Flory got all traumatised. So very slowly I cuddled Flory and like, her tears stopped and like, her breathing calmed down enough so that she then turned to me and went, Well, seen as I'm downstairs, could I have a biscuit? (laughs) No, Flo, back upstairs. It was very, it was a powerful moment as I set her free from the fear of her having leprosy. In this story, 
we see Jesus meeting a man on the road. This man is suffering with leprosy. An encounter with Jesus totally transforms his life. And leprosy wasn't just an unsightly skin disease. It was unbearably painful for the sufferer. Consequences, as Flory predicted, could include losing fingers or toes. Your face could become disfigured incredibly painful lesions but it also it made it impossible for you to work or for you to be in a relationship or in community and much more than that the Jewish people absolutely abhorred leprosy because they believed that it made you ceremonially unclean and they believed that if you were to touch somebody with leprosy that you yourself would also become ceremonially unclean and it stems from this belief that having leprosy was a curse from God and that if you were living with leprosy you had been cursed by God and in this story we see Jesus confronted by someone who has leprosy and we can see what God's reaction to that person is and rather than withdrawing or removing himself Jesus reaches out his hand towards this man towards this man who wouldn't have had the courage or the bravery to reach up and touch Jesus himself. And humanly speaking, the result of Jesus reaching out to touch this man should have been that both Jesus and the man became ceremonially unclean. But instead, at Jesus's touch, nothing remained broken, hurting, unclean or defiled. At Jesus's touch, the leper is healed. And I don't think we'll ever be able to fully understand the impact that that would have had on that man's life. Not only was he healed and set free from his pain and his illness, but also he was then able to be restored and invited back into society, able to work again, to have relationships with other people, to be included and to be loved. As he encountered Jesus, his life was totally transformed And we can't ever really describe what it feels like when someone encounters Jesus. Amazing just hearing those two stories and hearing Vanessa describe what happened when she was filled with the Holy Spirit, when she met with Jesus. Nothing can possibly quite compare. Liz, my wife and I, used to run a church down on the south coast of England in Portsmouth. And we used to run Alpha there three times a year. And I remember one occasion when we were running Alpha. We, it started in January 2020. So I remember it because it was just before lockdown. And people had come along. And there was one particular guy who was coming along to Alpha who was a university student in Portsmouth. And he'd been brought along by a friend. He didn't have any Christian background whatsoever. And his friend had him, invited him And he was quite sceptical. He was uh, asking lots of questions and debating lots of the information that he watched on the videos. And then halfway through the course, we ran a day where we looked at the person of the Holy Spirit. And this day was held, not very glamorously, upstairs in our small church office. There wasn't very good lighting or good sound, and there wasn't really much space as we stood amongst our desks. And I was a bit embarrassed, actually, of um, inviting him there, thinking, oh, it's a rain. It was February the 29th, 2020, I remember, because it was a leap year. And he came along, so I was surprised to begin with, and throughout the day, he heard talks. And on the Saturday night, there was a talk entitled, How Can I Be Filled with the Holy Spirit? And at the end of that talk, I approached him and offered to pray and said, could I pray that you would be filled with the Holy Spirit? And I prayed and nothing seemed particularly to happen. And then I left and went home. And then the next evening, I was welcoming people to our evening service at church. And I spotted this guy called Ethan coming through who'd been there yesterday. And I was like, hey, welcome. So nice to see you. Like, welcome to church. He'd been maybe once or twice before. And as he walked through the doors of church, he stopped and looked me in the eye. And he said, last night was the best night of my life. And I was slightly taken aback for a minute, thinking, I wonder what he's done. Maybe he went out and met someone. I just, I just, and then I like said, well, why? Like, it didn't seem to be anything special when you left. And he said, oh, I really sensed something when you prayed. And so I went home and I closed the door in my bedroom. And I remembered you said we were supposed to like put our hands out when we pray. So he said, I put my hands out and I prayed. I want to be filled with your Holy Spirit, Lord, and I want to know you. And he said, as he put his hands out, he 
describes feeling like the heaviest weight in his hands. And he said, it was like I was trying to hold the full weight of God's love in my arms and I could barely stand. He said, I've never experienced peace and freedom and joy like that ever before. It was the best night of my life. And as I was speaking to him, surprised by his description of what had happened, I thought back and remembered, why would I be so surprised? Because the evening that I was first filled with the Holy Spirit, when I met Jesus for the first time, it was and will always be the best night of my life. Because nothing can compare to an encounter with Jesus. If you have any other understanding of who God is, you might be here and you might not know how you would describe God, then I want to assure you that the only way that we can know what God is like is by looking at the person of Jesus. And we see in this story that Jesus kindly and with compassion reaches out to the outsider, demonstrates his love and heals and transforms his life. That is who Jesus is and what he is like. And if you're here today and you think perhaps you've never experienced the goodness of God or the love of God, you can know and be sure that there is nothing that could possibly disqualify you from being able to experience that same Jesus that Vanessa and others and Ethan and I experienced. The leper was the lowest of the low, the most outcast, the least in society. And Jesus reaches out and touches him. Jesus transforms lives. Secondly, we have the chance to see lives transformed. We get to play our part in seeing lives transformed. The Jesus that I'm talking about here is the Jesus who I know and who I have experienced in my own life. But, and I long for other people to know him as well. Over the years, I've told so many people about Jesus and I get excited when they come along to Alpha and I see their like, penny drop in their minds and we hear stories of how their lives have been transformed as well. But I don't always find it easy when I moved back to London, one of the most stressful things, which might sound ridiculous to you, is um, when we moved back was finding a barber. I mean, that sounds like a really odd thing to say, that finding a barber was the most traumatic thing about changing cities. But I get so nervous. I get nervous that they'll give me a bad haircut. And I basically get my haircut every two weeks. And so a barber becomes my best friend because I spend all my time with them. And I'm nervous that I won't know what the price is and then he'll charge me like 200 quid and I won't be able to pay. And I'm nervous about the small talk. And I'm also longing in some senses to be able to tell this barber about my faith and what I do, but also desperately nervous that I'll get a bad reaction. So I sort of sit there quite awkwardly and it always comes up straight away because the first question that a new barber will ask you is, so tell me, what do you do? And I go, here goes then, here goes, I'm a priest in the Church of England, you should come to Alpha. (sighs) Really nervous. And when I have these chance encounters, whether it's sitting next to somebody on a flight or with a barber, there's a very small part of me that over the years has come to wonder whether it's kinder not to share my faith. There's just a little part of me that thinks, oh, maybe it's impolite, or maybe it would be kinder not to make them listen to me talk about Jesus or my faith for the next half an hour. And maybe it's because somewhere along the line I didn't share my faith very respectfully or I got it wrong or maybe I left somebody feeling like a bit awkward or uncomfortable. But when I hear stories like we heard this morning and when I'm reminded of what it's like to meet with Jesus for the first time, like this story when he met the leper, I realise that the kindest thing that we could ever do is to introduce somebody to Jesus. I want to be somebody who is kind and loving and the best way that I can do that is to invite someone to Alpha so they can meet Jesus. The greatest injustice in the world is people having never heard that Jesus loves them. And I want to be someone who fights against injustice. The truth is that lots of people in London don't know this Jesus that I've described. Last year at Alpha, we did some research looking at that question and 64% of people in London said the church was not relevant to their everyday life. 73% of people in London said they didn't know what Alpha was at all. And of the people in London who did know what Alpha was, 
60% of them had never been invited. And it made me realise that some of those people who know what Alpha is, who've never been invited, are people in my life, like my barber or my father. Because I've been perhaps too nervous or shy to invite them. And I don't know if you noticed, Catherine mentioned that on your seats there should have been an Alpha flyer. And if you take it out, you can see on the back there are tear-off invites so that you can tear a little business card and give it to somebody, whether that's someone that you come across in your workplace, in your um, family, and you can invite them to come to Alpha. And in one sense, this is just an Alpha flyer and it tells you what time Alpha is running. There's nothing special about it. It's just a little printed leaflet that you can take away, stick on your fridge or put in the recycling. But in another sense, what you hold in your hand could be the ticket to somebody experiencing healing in their life. It could be the most powerful thing that you have on your possession. Because it could be the ticket to somebody for the first time encountering Jesus, being healed and being set free. The best way I've discovered to be able to introduce someone to a relationship with Jesus is on Alpha. And sometimes I get it wrong and I'm a bit awkward about it. But I know that this is the best way possibly to help them know the Jesus that I've described, the Jesus that we read about in this story. So an encounter with Jesus transforms lives. Secondly, we get to play our part in seeing lives transformed. And thirdly and finally, an encounter with Jesus is exactly what the world needs. It's exactly what this city needs. Many of us were at the leadership conference on Monday and Tuesday that Archie mentioned, this amazing global gathering of leaders from all across the world, 5,000 people. And what really struck me about the leadership conference this year was that perhaps 10, 12 years ago, conferences like this were primarily about what Christian leaders could learn from the worlds of business and politics. And we could be more effective at the Christian life or at leading in a Christian sphere by understanding what the world of politics and business could have to teach us. And in in those ensuing 10 years, over the last 10 years, what we've seen is those models of, many of those models of leadership in business and politics really fail and crumble. And on Monday and Tuesday, I thought it was the most incredible celebration of the upside down kingdom of Jesus that there is one and only one leader that any of us could ever point to, to say this is the person who has led with kindness, compassion and humility. The one person that we could hold up and say, if you follow this person, you can be sure that you're following the right person. And it made me feel really excited because again, it reminded me that it is the church by following Jesus that has something to teach the world of business and culture, society and politics. That each one of us, as we go out into our workplaces, not tomorrow because of bank holiday, but on Tuesday, will be able to take with us exactly what the world needs. What the world needs is an encounter with Jesus. In 2009, I met then Prince Charles, at an HTB event actually. He came to visit our theological college, which is over at one of our other locations. And he came down and he shook some hands and it was really quite like a nice moment meeting Prince Charles singing, you know, I've met the future king. And I shook his hand and he said hello and then he left. And other than calling my mum to say, mum, just met Prince Charles, it didn't leave a huge lasting impact on my life. He was, I'm sure, and is a kind and lovely man. But what was amazing yesterday of watching the service held at Westminster Abbey of the coronation of the king was that in one sense that service was a celebration to crown King Charles. More than that, that service pointed at a different king. The whole service pointed to a greater king. Archbishop Justin Welby said these words, Jesus was a king so much greater than any earthly king. His throne was a cross. His crown was made of thorns. His regalia were the wounds that pierced his body. Jesus is the king who I need in my life. He's the king I want to meet and the king that I want to introduce everyone else to. 
Jesus is the only king who can transform and change our lives, bring healing and freedom and peace. And we have this amazing privilege of taking that message to the world to see other lives changed and transformed. Amen. Amen. Would you like to stand as we pray?